We are lucky enough to have with us today Chip Heath. Uh, Chip and I met right around when he he and Dan uh, together they write as a brother duo. Uh, Dan and Chip Heath they were writing Switch: uh, How to Change Things When Change Is Hard, and we spoke about that book. Um, I had already read Made to Stick, which I thought was an absolutely fantastic book. I really loved it and had already given it to some clients. They also write, wrote Decisive a few years ago, and they are out with a new book, The Power of Moments, uh, Why Certain Moments Have Extraordinary Impact. Um, we've got half of the bro duo. We have uh, Chip with us today. Uh, Chip, thank you so much for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thanks for having me. So, Chip, what led you to write this book? You've written, this is your fourth book. Why this one? So there are so many moments that we have in our lives that that are incredibly important. And we're good as a culture about thinking about birthdays and retirement dinners. But there are so many moments that pass unacknowledged. And and yet those moments can have great impact if we take a little bit of time to think about them. So, you know, consider the first day at work. It's a huge day for the employee. But the typical, the typical employer, you know, you, you wander up and you, you introduce yourself to the receptionist and the person's really happy to see you, but they actually thought you were coming in next Tuesday. And, and you know, so they take you to your cubicle and the computer's not quite hooked up and there are cords dangling and, you know, somebody thrusts an employee manual in your hand and says, well, I've got to run off to a meeting, but, you know, maybe you could read this for a while. And so you spend the morning reading about expense policy and sexual harassment policy, which is actually shockingly more relevant today than it was six weeks ago. Um, but it's not it's not the ideal first day. And so the, the amount of inattention that we pay to really important moments for people is just shocking to, to Dan and I. And you define a moment as sort of a short experience as both memorable and meaningful. And yeah. and this sounds like a maybe a silly question, but why is it important in life to have these defining moments? Like wh- why not just live your life the way you're living your life? What's the importance of of making a moment a moment or having like, why is it important that that first day of work is a memorable, impactful moment? Yeah. And I think it's important because those are the things that we remember. So the things that we take away from life or, you know, if we go on a vacation for two weeks, we don't remember the whole two weeks. We can't run the film strip of the vacation. What we remember are a handful of, of dinners and stunning moments with our family and, and, and why don't we take control of that as opposed to letting it happen to us. And so, So are the things that we can do to make moments more meaningful for ourselves and for the people around us. You know, when I think of memorable moments in my life, when I really look back at memorable moments and I look back at the photographs that I took in in my life, I realize there's an incredible correlation and that my memory is constructed, you know, as much by the photographs that I took (laughs) in those moments as they are by the moments themselves. I literally, in my memory, I have that photograph as opposed to the moment itself. And I'm wondering whether, you know, certainly in this age of selfies where, you know, we're taking pictures at every moment, whether that's a, a, a losing attempt at trying to, you know, augment moments to the memorable or whether that's a useful piece of it. It's not something you talk about in the book, but is it, is it, a, is it a useful piece of it? And, and, and what's the role of kind of uh, uh, creating a memory of that moment versus creating a moment that you remember? Yeah, I, I think I think is a nice observation, and, and I think the memory of the moment versus the moment that matters is, is I think a key distinction that we would like to draw. I don't think we drew it in the book, but thank you for that. Um, so I think selfies selfies are an attempt to make memorable things that fundamentally aren't very memorable. And 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 what we want to talk about in the book is you know suppose the first day at work were putting you in touch with the history of the organization and the great stories from the organization. Those would be memorable to you without selfies, and yet they would be probably more useful to you in the future going forward. Because if you understand what made this organization great in the past, then you're likely to be able to to leverage those strengths in the future. Um, so, example: John Deere went into China and India, and in the States, we are a lot of us are a couple of generations away from people that actually were farmers, and so you may have encountered a John Deere tractor or encountered somebody that used one. Uh, in India, you're less likely to do that. In China, you're not likely to do that. And so they had a real trouble getting people up to speed on the organization. And so they revamped the, the first day. And so one of the things that they did was have your first email. So your computer was hooked up when you showed up in your cubicle. And it was showing beauty shots of tractors. And and, and the, the screenshot said, you know, welcome to the most important work you ever do. And you click over and your first emails from the CEO. 
and the CEO comes on a video and says, look, this company has a 175 year legacy. Started with John Deere, who had a patent for for a plow. It's kind of a wooden plow with you know the two hands, but there's a metal fixture on it that kept the plow from fouling with roots. You know, and this is 175 years ago. We had the first technological innovation by John Deere, and it was a wood handled plow. And so for 175 years, we've been making machines that help people feed themselves and help create shelter. And, and that's important work, and especially in the world with the growing population. And so you go through that, and all of a sudden you have a different picture of your work and you know things you're about to hear from your manager of your assignments and the things that your colleagues are doing. You're helping provide food and shelter for a growing world, and you've been doing it in a, you're doing it in a company that has a 175 year legacy of that. It's great. Um, I have one other question, sort of related to this power of moment. Before we get into some of the some of the details, the you know I think of mindfulness experts right? Who talk about having each moment be powerful, like chewing a raisin should be a powerful moment, right? You chew a raisin, you do it slowly enough and you pay attention enough. And that moment, you elevate that moment, right? To, to something greater than just gobbling down a whole bunch of raisins. Um, is that possible? Or does part of what makes a moment powerful is that it's scarce. That's not one of the four elements that you talk about, but I wonder whether scarcity and space between moments becomes a critical element to having that moment be be important and powerful uh, and meaningful and memorable. Yeah, I, I think it's an important concept. And the first response is we're nowhere close to making most moments that should be powerful, powerful. And so I don't think we have a problem with scarcity quite yet. Um, but I'm reminded of a quote that I loved when I was in high school. It's like, music music is not the notes. It's the spaces between the notes mm-hmm. that make the music. And and I think that's that's your point. And and I agree with that. If, if we had, if we were really able to be mindful enough that we could store every single thing that happens to us, I don't think we'd be better off. You know, in fact, the function of memory, you know, people that study cognitive psychologists that study memory really come to appreciate forgetting. Because there are occasionally people that remember everything and their life is miserable. You know, people that remember the, the library card that they had when they were a kid and the numbers on their telephones for the last 10 houses. And, you know, it's just it's an impossible life to sustain. But I think we would be happy if people remember 50 percent more things that they should be remembering. And I think we're a long way away from the, the, the quirky memory people that can remember everything in their life. Right. You know, it reminds me, Dan Pink was suggesting a an app that's, I, th- I don't think it's called 360. I, I downloaded it. I can't quite remember what it's called. But you basically take a one-second video, yes. upload a one-second video every day, and then at the end of the year, you've got six seconds, uh, I mean, six minutes of, like, the video of your year. Yeah. And that's sort of an interesting concept, which is that it brings you back, it, it elevates a moment in the day, actually. I mean, I've been using great- it. It's a great concept, and, and I have a friend that's been doing it for several years now. I think he was one of the early adopters, and it's, it's stunning to watch his videos because it is, I know enough about his family and his life that I watch his videos, and I love his memories You know, for, for that. I, I don't have the self-discipline to take the, the second a day, um, but it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful thing. So there's this challenge, I think, with the expectations that we set up by creating a powerful moment. Um, and and I, I think of it as the challenge of New Year's resolutions, which is that we sort of set this expectation that that we may uh, sometimes, maybe even often, fail to, to, to live up to. So if the first day at John Deere is as amazing as, you know, you've described it and the CEO is talking to me and this is the most important job, and the second day they're like, here's 12 files of things and slowly work your way through and et cetera, it's like, whoa, I had such high expectations of what this might be. And now the follow through is, you know, is disappointing. And, and, you know, the, 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 you know, you've heard people say, I'm sure sometimes like the key to great customer service or great customer satisfaction is low expectations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not something I would suggest that you create low expectations, but, but it's, you know, people's satisfaction is so determined by the reality related to the expectations that they had. And I'm wondering what you saw in your research and in the stories you heard people told of the risk of that. I think we worry about that risk more than more than we should, because for the most part, the things that we find meaningful 
are things that are actually quite boring, quite mundane. You know, so if you think about being a parent, um, one of my favorite books of recent years is is a, a book that talks about uh, the title is All Joy and No Fun. And, and, and I think that summarizes parenting is like there is incredible joy in being a parent. But if you if you did a beeper on a minute by minute basis, it's miserable. You know, you've got to haul the kids back and forth between this practice and that practice. And when they're younger, you're you're just trying to maintain sanity and get meals on the table and get food in the babies and get them cleaned. And and so there's a lot of joy in being a parent that people have actually done beeper studies and, and your your moment to moment satisfaction as a parent drops when you become a parent and stays down until the kids graduate and leave the house. And then, you know, the satisfaction trends upward again. Um, so, so, so I think the John Deere situation could be setting people up for a fall the second day, because the second day can't be as quite as meaningful and as memorable as the first day. But I think another way of interpreting it is if I've gone through that first day and I get the 12 boring files to file, all of a sudden I'm thinking of myself as doing something meaningful and important in the context of John Deere, as opposed to, you know, showing up the first day and it was boring and your computer wasn't set up. And the second day you get 12 files to file. And then I think the third day you'd be wondering whether this was the right place or not. Right. So let's, you know, we've been dancing around it. Let's talk about the four elements that you talk about in this book that make up, uh, you know, that, that we need to focus on or manipulate or master or be thoughtful about to, to, to make up a, a powerful moment. And you um, intentionally do not acronymize it uh, epic because it would remind you too much of a stone surfer. But, mm-hmm. you know, the idea of elevation, insight, pride, and connection. Can you just give a sentence or two about each to give us some context of what, here are some things you talk about in a lot of detail about how to elevate a moment or how to create a memorable, powerful moment. Yeah. I don't think we'll have time to talk through all of them today, but, but elevation is, it, a lot of the moments that people remember are moments of heightened sensory experience. So you go to the fireworks show and there's the sound and the sight of that. You go to an amusement park and you get the thrill ride. Um, you, you get a favorite food at a restaurant with your family. It's a meaningful moment. So that's a moment of elevation. There are moments of insight when we learn something new about ourselves or about the world. Um, we decide this is not the job for us or you know that's the person we want to marry. Those are moments of insight that we carry for a lifetime. There are moments of pride. So people love being recognized for for things that they've accomplished. Um, people love the feeling of accomplishment when we tackle a challenge athletically or, or intellectually and master uh, that challenge. And then there are moments of connection. Those are some of the most important moments of life. So all the pictures that you talked about earlier, if your your house, God forbid, someday you know, burns down, those are the things that you grab in those final moments is the pictures that you have about people that, that you've been close to. And so what we find when we ask people what are the most meaningful moments in their lives, we find those themes of elevation, pride, insight, connection coming up over and over again. You have this amazing line. It's, it actually might be my favorite line of the whole book, um, where it, which is related to um, elevation, which is beware of the soul-sucking force of reasonableness. And um, I love it. I think it's great. Yeah. Can, can you can you speak to that and and um, you know the, its role in creating a power it, its its importance in terms of creating a powerful moment? Yeah, I, I think that the insight is that the bureaucracies, as wonderful as they are, are designed to suppress good things. Right? They're they're designed to do normal things reliably and well. And so one of our favorite examples in the book of an elevated moment is uh, is a hotel in Los Angeles, one of the top three hotels in Los Angeles. And the competitors of these chic boutique hotels that Hollywood, you know, have the big massive pools and the beautiful interiors and cost $800 a night. And uh, so one is one of the top three is one of those kind of boutique hotels. Another is the Four Seasons of Beverly Hills, which we know is a classic service brand. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing facility. The other one is called the Magic Castle Hotel. It's a converted 1960s apartment building painted kind of canary yellow, not, not a particularly attractive shade of yellow. And yet it is it is one of the top three hotels in all of Los Angeles. And one hint about what they're doing right is by the pool, there's a red phone, looks like Cold War era surplus that, you know, the president might have used to call the premier of the Soviet Union at an intense moment. And you pick up the phone. Well, above the phone is a sign that says Popsicle Hotline. 
And so you pick up the phone and somebody on the other end says, uh, we'll be right there. And in a few minutes later out of the office comes a person carrying a, a silver tray with white gloves and they pass out popsicles to the people at, at the, the pool. And, and it's a moment that everybody remarks on, everybody remembers it after the vacation. They call the popsicle hotline, they get the popsicle delivered by the pool. And yet bureaucracy, the soul sucking force of reasonableness would be anti popsicle hotline. I mean, you can just the hear CFO the operation. would say the CFO would say, you know, what are these costing us? And, and, yeah. you know, if they, how much money can we make if everybody paid a dollar for that at the end of the year and the yeah, staff yeah. time and et cetera. And, and the HR person is going to be saying, well, we've got critical resources that we train our front desk people very intensively. And could we, can we really afford to have them taking off and putting on gloves and walking around the pool and, operations person is saying, well, instead of the popsicle hotline, why don't we just have a self-serve cooler by the pool? And, and, and you know, so the organization would kick in and do what organizations do, which is to streamline things, to make them normal, to make them standardized. And yet what makes moments stand out very often is the non-standardized, the surprising, the different. And, and I, think, I think we do that in life. I mean, if we're, if we're planning a vacation, we plan probably a lot more relaxation than we should relative to novel events and novel things that we do with our families. And so we'd go eat a burger or a pizza because that's what the kids want to do instead of trying the Hawaiian food that might be make, we, we might not enjoy the meal even as much at the time, but later on when we talk about the trip, we're going to be talking about that Hawaiian meal. So, you know, we're on this podcast and, um, and there's all sorts of things that we could do to make this a memorable moment for listeners. And I'm wondering how you take a moment that's, that's, you know, in many ways mundane, right? I am interviewing you and we're having a conversation uh, around the book and around the power of moments. And, and I don't even know if this is a fair question. So tell me if this is not like, you can't think of moments in this way, but if we wanted to, you know, elevate this moment uh, or, you know, hopefully we're creating some insights or do something to, to increase the power and memorability and meaningfulness of this moment for everybody who's listening. What's something that you would suggest? Well, I think we've been doing it already. We've been telling stories. We've been making applications to people so that they will have insight in their lives. Um, I think, I think that's my answer is like if, if organizations just told more stories, that would lead to more insight, lead to more elevation. I think, I think the other point I make in the book is it, it takes some time to do these things. And so one of my favorite examples is a, a group of teachers that uh, set out to create a, a moment that was as memorable as junior, senior prom, but that was academic in nature. And, and they said, you know, it's ironic that kids spend most of their time in class, and yet our memories of junior high and high school are probably the, the dances that we went to, the football games, the, the, the athletic the athletic competitions, the debate competition. And so they set out to, to create a moment. And what they did is they, they came up with this idea of the trial of human nature. So remember the Lord of the Flies, mm -hmm. this, this book that they're, you know, kids get marooned on the deserted island and end up committing murder and uh, de devolving into this nasty, brutish behavior. And they said, so you're sitting in English class one day and somebody slaps a big look, important looking legal document on your table. And it turns out it's a lawsuit against William Golding, the author of Lord of the Flies, for libel against human nature. And the way that this trial unfolds is they're going to put him on trial and say, look, you created this very popular book that defames humanity. And because of that, you know, people look at violence and they say, oh, that's, that's normal, that's expected because that's human nature. And yet we should be outraged when there's violence. We should be outraged at war. And William Golden, you're responsible for this. And so the way the trial unfolds is the kids get to call any witness on the prosecution or the defense side that they would like. So you could call Anne Frank to testify about how brutish behavior is. You could call Tupac Shakur, actually one of the, uh, so there's a feud between East Coast and West Coast rappers at one point in the States. And so over the years, people have called lots of rappers. In fact, one of the, one of the only rules that they put into this, this event is each side can only call two rappers in to testify on their on their side. Um, but every year they conduct this trial. It's it's conducted in a real courtroom in San Mateo County. Uh, it's Hillsdale High in San Mateo, California, that does this. And so, so a sitting Superior Court judge has agreed to preside for a day every year over the trial of human nature. 
And so the kids call their witnesses. They call Darth Vader. They call Jane Goodall to testify about chimpanzees, their closest relatives, and whether they're violent or not. Uh, they called um, royalty from England. We called Lady Macbeth. They called Tuck, uh, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. And and so they spend weeks preparing for this. The lawyers, the kid lawyers, know procedure like incredibly well. The judge is always impressed by how how well they do their objections and and insight about the process of the trial. And this is an event that becomes one of the defining moments of that high school history. And one of the teachers at Hillsdale High said, every graduation speech by one of the kids, they'll mention the trial of human nature as a standout moment. He said, nobody's ever mentioned the problem. Right. <laughs> and, and that's, that's, that's a victory. Right. And so, so one answer to your question about, you know, what can we do on a podcast? Well, we're probably not, we shouldn't be doing a podcast if we want a really memorable moment. Um, but within within the constraints of the the medium, um, I mean, what those teachers have done is clearly more effort, and you know they're not getting paid for this. They're not getting paid to arrange buses to drive their students to the Superior Courtroom of Hillsdale High. But was it worth it? Well, in an academic career, I mean, you probably went to good schools. I went to good schools. I went to public schools all my life. There were great teachers. There were great exercises. But for the twelve years that I went. From grade school to high school, I can remember maybe three or four years where there's something that is a defining moment for me. Right. And you know, shouldn't shouldn't there be at least one per year that we have going right. to school? Yeah, you talk. I mean, this is a great example of what you talk about in the book uh, around breaking the script, right? Which is that we sort of know what's expected every day at school, but if suddenly someone you know, plucks, plunks down a, a you know a legal lawsuit, brief. a legal yeah. brief that after you know, and it it starts you know, a color war of sorts, you know, it's why, like, when you think of, I think of color war at camp, and I think, you know, why does camp need color war? Because all of camp is, but if you're going to take what's already kind of memorable and dramatic every single day, and you need to increase the drama of it in order to create a peak moment, you do something like color war. Yeah. It sort of says that, you know, no matter what you're doing, you can always sort of, you know, elevate the 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 game in a way that changes the dynamic by breaking the script. Yeah, and 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 I think there there are missed opportunities even in cultural events that are otherwise very well very well organized. So we take birthday parties. We do birthday parties for our kids and occasionally for ourselves when we get big birthdays going older. And they always involve elevation. We always have great food. Um, kid version of that is a little different than adult version of that. But you know, think about. Cupcake is a perfect compact moment of elevation. You got sugar, fat, and flame, and the same, you know, compact object. But so we do, we do elevation well. We do connection well. We bring in friends and family. Um, but imagine what it'd be like to add a moment of insight. You know, so suppose every year of your life you had written down one tip that that you learned this year, one thing that you learned this year that you would like to leave for your future self. Mm -hmm. And imagine going back and you know, I would, I would really love to go back and see what my 18 year old self said, you know, when I was 18 or my 30 year old self or my seven year old self. And, and so there, there are these things that we could do to add a little bit of extra to even that very well designed cultural event. And I don't think we take those opportunities. It's great. You've just given me a task to follow through on with my three kids and I'm, I'm hitting them a little late. You know, the youngest is 10 and the oldest is 15, but but it's, uh, but it's a great thing to get them to start doing now. Yes. Yeah. I think it would be great to look back at that and go, you know, what are the insights I've gleaned? And, and it's sort of the, the annual corollary to the daily practice of taking a one second video and then looking at a picture of your life for the year. That's right. That's, That's right. Great. Um, Dan, I'm sorry, Chip, it's, it's such a pleasure uh, talking to you and, and kind of unpacking elements of this book. The book is, is such an interesting read. You do what you, you and Dan do what you always do, which is, you know, write in such engaging stories uh, that the principles sort of jump out at, at the page. You're not listing a bunch of things to do. You're you're telling the story of, of how you discovered all of this. And it's really a fantastic read. The Power of Moments, Why Certain Moments Have Extraordinary Impact. It's written by uh, Chip and Dan Heath, who are brothers. We have Chip Heath with us today. Chip, thank you so much for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thank you for having me.